correct me if I'm wrong, but it's money that makes the world go round, right? Adam Smith, did he not just invent capitalism, but also laissez-faire capitalism? What the heck does laissez-faire mean? Is it simply another term for greed? These and other questions will be answered right after this. I am Professor Jerome Arkenberg, and I have been teaching a wide variety of history courses at colleges across this country for the past 30 years. In this video, I'm going to tell you about David Ricardo and Hobbesian economics, Richard Cobden and the rise of laissez-faire capitalism, Herbert Spencer and sociological economics, and William Graham Sumner and unfettered greed. At the end, I'll have the wrap-up quote on this video, so be sure to stick around for that. But first, make sure to click like, share, and especially subscribe, and that little bell thingy, so I can continue to bring you more great videos just like this one. In the early stages of the Industrial Revolution, industrialists and entrepreneurs who struggled with the limitations imposed upon them by either old-style medieval guild or new-style mercantilist regulations adopted Adam Smith's theories as a way to free themselves from government interference. This laissez-faire liberalism held that with the adoption of free trade and Lockean, as John Locke, limited government in place of mercantilism, material and spiritual progress for all in society would come about. So all, even the poor, would be living a dream like this in a house like this. In 1817, the Principles of Political Economy and Taxation by David Ricardo, who was born in 1772 and died in 1823, presented a different, non-Smithian, non-Enlightenment, more Hobbesian, it's Thomas Hobbes, view of economic life as being a war of all against all, that is, vicious cutthroat competition. Based on the ideas of Thomas Malthus, as you see here, who held that there is a limit to population growth based on the limited nature of cultivable land, meaning that the food supply, as you see here, can only grow arithmetically while population grows exponentially. So Ricardo said that given this Malthusian choice, Instead of increasing opulence for all, only a few would benefit, certainly not the workers who keep it all running. For when wealth accumulates and is reinvested into new shops and factories, the demand for laborers increases, which boosts wages. But workers, instead of investing their surplus wages, spend it on good times and have more children, as Adam Smith said they would. But as the population grows, more mouths demand more food, and more food demands more land under cultivation. So rent for land rises as pressure mounts to put every available piece of land under cultivation, causing food prices to soar as rent rises, causing wages to rise just to meet the cost of food. 
This in turn causes the price of goods to rise, leading profits to shrink until they equal cost, ending the cycle of investment and production, leading not to socioeconomic progress, but recession and depression, and a gloomy, miserable existence for both rich and poor. So what's the solution? According to Ricardo, it's the removal of all economic regulations and tariffs imposed and duties. So free trade in all things, including food, is the only way to stab off a gloomy, depressing world of bare subsistence. And this idea was enthusiastically adopted by industrialists and entrepreneurs fighting against government interference. Richard Cobden, you see him here, born in 1804 and died in 1865. He was a Manchester textile manufacturer and ran with Ricardo's ideas, advocating freedom of contract, so no unions, economic non-interference by government, universal free trade, and pacifism, because war is bad for business. This later became known as laissez-faire liberalism. Also, building on the ideas of David Ricardo was this man here, the great mutton chops, Herbert Spencer, born in 1820, died in 1903, who provided further scientific proof, foundation, which he did, for laissez-faire liberalism in his 1850 social statics, where he argued that the state was a menace to the natural evolution of any society. He showed, he said, that social mechanisms were just as complex as any biological mechanism, and that the more a society advances, the more complex and delicate its mechanisms become. As a result, he said, any actions by the state, whether to slow or stop progress or to advance and accelerate it, only serve to muck everything up, causing societies to decline and collapse. And so the state should just keep their hands off. William Graham Sumner probably the most important capitalist theorist you have probably never heard of, he was born in 1840, dies in 1910. In his book, What Social Classes Owe to Each Other, of 1883, added that if government steps in to establish welfare, the entire burden would fall on the middle class. Why? Because the poor have no money and the rich can always find ways to avoid it. Since government produces no wealth of its own, when people say that government should pay for welfare, they are really saying that government should force those who can be taxed to transfer their property to those who are not, cannot, or will not make it on their own in society. And I have heard a number of right-wing conservative economists say this and claim this idea as their own, though it was first said by William Graham Sumner. However, the bulk of the voters in any democracy, he says, which of course are the middle classes, especially the lower middle classes, the blue collar ones, are more likely to fall into poverty in any economic downturn, and thus will always, always demand the most generous welfare benefits possible, as it is in their own self-interest to do so. Which means, Sumner says, that welfare destroys the natural relationship 
between those who are successful and those who are not, turning it upside down. As through welfare, those who are successful owe those who are unsuccessful, since taxation forces those who have succeeded to give the result of their hard labor, their money, to those who cannot or will not be successful, who of course are the poor. Following this? This, therefore, according to Sumner, destroys economic progress, as why should anyone strive to succeed when, as soon as they do so, they are forced to turn over, via taxation and various welfare schemes, the fruits of their hard labor to the poor, lazy, and unsuccessful. Which means, as a result, he said, do not have any welfare, any help for those who will not or cannot work hard to be successful and limit government interference through taxation or regulation on the economy because government, he says, neither creates wealth nor ensures progress, but really based on his ideas and that of Herbert Spencer, who was really the first sociologist, by the way, but on Herbert Spencer, government neither creates wealth nor ensures progress, but simply slows or destroys it. Here's the wrap-up quote. Today, the world obtains commodities of excellent quality at prices which even the preceding generation would have deemed incredible. In the commercial world, similar causes have produced similar results, and the race is benefited thereby. The poor enjoy what the rich could not before afford. What were the luxuries have become the necessaries of life. The laborer has now more comforts than the farmer had a few generations ago. The farmer has more luxuries than the landlord had and is more richly clad and better housed. The landlord has books and pictures, rarer and appointments more artistic than the king could then obtain. Andrew Carnegie. So, let me know what you think of this quote in the comment section below. Also, what you liked about this video and what other historical topics or subjects you'd like to see in future videos. Be sure to click like, share, especially subscribe, as it will help me bring you more great videos just like this one. And click on that little bell thingy so you'll know when the next History Waits for No One video is posted. If you want to know more, there are recommended studies on this topic in the description below, along with other ways to connect with me. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the past.